So preparing for the build. So what we've got to do is prepare the host system. Well, we're kind of part of the way through that because we've booted a live uh, system. Um, we've still got some more work to do. We're then going to uh, fetch all the packages, all the source code and the patches that are needed to build Linux from scratch 12.1. And then we're going to finally set up the environment ready to start some compiling. So let's move on to preparing the host system. And introduction says in this chapter, host tools needed for building LFS are checked and if necessary installed. Then a partition which will host the LFS system is prepared will create the partition itself, create a file system on it and mount it. So host system requirements, this is really important. Uh, a lot of people skip this and then they wonder why they can't build using the instructions uh, in the LFS book. And normally the reason is though I've got a file missing. One of these files, one of these programs is missing or it's too old. And that's why they've come up against the problem because of either of those two reasons. Um, and the reason why they've put this is because they know that the version of Linux from scratch that you're building in this book will work with these versions of uh, the binaries or anything newer. And it gives some reasons as to why um, they recommend these versions. They've also kindly put in a script here which allows you to check these automatically. And they've improved it recently, so it's a lot easier to read actually. Rather than having to go down and cross check each individual package yourself, it'll actually do the checking for you and report it. So you can see in the code here, if it's okay, you'll get a little okay next to the name of the package. If there's a problem with it for any reason, you'll get an error come up. So it's a lot easier to work out if the packages that you've got installed are correct or not. And it can be a bit misleading sometimes. For example, you might get a package like um, yeah, bin utils 2.13.1 and you've got 2.8.1. Now is 13 greater than eight, is it? Or is it the fact that the ones, uh, sorry, is 13, yeah, greater than eight. So the 2.8 is an older version or is it taken in a, uh, in a, like an alphabetical sense in that the one is less than the eight. So the one would come before the eight. Does that mean that the one three is less than Point eight. It can be a bit hard to read them sometimes. So the fact that they've improved the script and it puts the um, report, the results out for you is makes it a lot simpler and a lot quicker to check. So I've just highlighted that with the mouse and then center clicked it into the terminal and you can see it's executed. And everything on the left hand column says OK. So that's what I want to see. If any of these said error, I'd have to go back and resolve that problem. Sometimes, um, occasionally, although it doesn't happen so much now because a lot of these packages are quite old now, the, the base packages uh, on this side, sorry, you can see the Bison version 2.7, that's you know maybe, I don't know, could be 10 years old, that, that version. Um, it may be that your version, say 2.6, what you can do sometimes is download the latest version of Bison and compile it on the host system and then carry on with the Linux from scratch. If that's if it's just one package that's out of date and it's not too old, um, you can normally get away with doing that if that's a problem. But as I say, um, it tends to be the fact now that there's a wide range of versions that you can compile from and it's it's more unlikely that you'll come across this problem of not having tools that are, are newer enough to build with what you're more likely to come across if especially if you haven't used gen 2 or endeavor os is you've used a host system that hasn't got certain of these packages installed by default because they're not required on a normal desktop they're, they're for development purposes um, and that's that's where you'll have to try and find out um, what those packages are and how to install them. Um, if you do 
have that situation where you've got packages missing you can go to my YouTube channel and I do actually have a video although it's a little bit out of date now it should still um, be appropriate um, it shows you for some well, what were some of the most popular distributions at the time uh, if you go to playlists probably the quickest way yes it's quite a way back here this this video here or set of videos Linux from scratch host requirements for um, Linux from scratch just wait for this oh I don't need to watch it actually but down here you can see this I think yeah I've done 12 of the most common um, distributions at the time um, how to check for the host system requirements and if you need to do any changes so for example Ubuntu is one of them um, where you do need to do some work let's wait for this video to finish So, uh, oh, I wonder why it keeps showing me the same advert. Right, so, yeah, you can see here on this Ubuntu, GCC is not found. Um, obviously, this is not the same version check, but it's showing that, um, well, A, it shows that the status of each package is not shown. It just says that it can't find it. Um, but later on, I show in the video, I'll show how to actually fix that and get GCC installed. In fact, it's this bit here show what packages are needed to actually get the system up to a standard which is good enough for Linux from scratch and finally at the end um, I don't know if I can see it somewhere yeah it's just finishing the update there there I've rerun it and you can see there's no packages not found there but as I say if you do do go with um, Gen 2 as I recommend then uh, you won't have any problems at all. It's just simple. Everything's there. Another new thing that's worth noting. They've, well, uh, there's two things actually. They've separated out uh, the aliases. So these packages actually need um, aliases. So ORC needs to be a symlink to, oh, sorry, this one. Yeah, ORC is a symlink to GORK. Um, as you can see, it's checked for GORK. Yak is a sim link to Bison. Uh, Bison's checked there. And SH is a sim link to Bash. So every system should have a, an SH pointing to a shell. And in this case, it should be pointing to Bash. Um, the other change that's been made, so that's been separated out. Previously, that was on the same line as those particular uh, binaries. The other thing that's changed is that they run the MPROC binary to indicate how many um, logical cores are available so this CPU's got eight cores but they're hyper threaded so I've actually got 16 cores available so that's worth knowing because when we go into building Linux from scratch uh, we can tell the compiler to use as many cores as we've got and we can either specify that um, explicitly by putting in 16 or we might want to say use only 10 for example or you could even just use the NPROC output. Um, so, you know, that would make uh, Linux and Scratch a bit more portable if you're maybe automating the build. So we're all okay, as I'd expect. This is a Gen 2 image that's just been downloaded today. The images are updated, I believe, every week. So it's no more than a week old. So I wouldn't expect anything to fail here. I'd be very surprised if, if something did. So that's that. Let's now move on. And
and again this goes over in a little bit more detail now what's going to happen in each chapter that's coming up and then we move on to creating a new partition so we need to create a part or we need to partition the hard disk so that we can build Linux from scratch so what I'm going to do this is where I have to do things a bit away from the book because there's no details in the book and I've often wondered why but I think I've come to the conclusion that the reason is they can't cater for everybody's situation. They don't know how many disks you've got, what the disk is, you know, whether it's an NVMe, an SSD, a, a spinning hard disk, um, what existing partitions you've got if you wanted to keep any. There's so many combinations. So what they've done is like giving hints here and what you should be doing, how it should be uh, laid out. So, like I say, I'll just veer away from here and I'll wig it a little bit here um, and hopefully I won't make any mistakes. But the first thing we'll do is to do F disk minus L and that lists all the disks on the system. So we've got a loop that back device here, which is the system that we're running at the moment, the live CD, so we want to ignore that. We've got a NVMe device here. So that is actually the um, disk that's in the system at the moment and then I've got a dev SDA disk which is the USB that I've booted from so this USB has provided this loop back image here so these two I want to ignore it's this particular device here that I want to take note of so as you can see it's already got the Windows system that we downloaded the uh, live USB system on and we ran Rufus on to write the USB drive and we want to get rid of that. Now, depending on what hard disk you've got, depends on how you want to or how you uh, wipe this system, uh, wipe the hard disk. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about how to do it for different machines. Um, I am planning on doing a separate video on that um, because certainly for electronic disks, the SSDs and NVMEs, you don't want to be writing zeros or random data to the disk because you're just going to be wearing them out and reducing the life of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to wipe the disk using wipefs and this wipes the file system structure from the disk. And as you can see it says it wipes the, file, uh, the signatures from a device. So what I'm going to do is do wipefs minus A to wipe all the uh, strings and what else can I do here display help I thought there was a verbose output there isn't print out passable instead of printable format Right, it looks like all I need to do is press A on its own. I can do an N to do a test, a dry run, so no action, as you can see there. Do everything except the actual write. So it will go through everything except for actually making the changes. And then I need to put the device in. So that's the device there. So I'll just double click that, it will highlight it. It's now been copied into the um, uh, keyboard, uh, sorry, the cat, uh, the Clipboard, sorry, not keyboard, the clipboard. So if I just center click that, it will paste it in. If I press enter, and you can see it's telling me that it's right, uh, erasing the GPT signatures. Uh, the, I can't remember, is it a pseudo MBR uh, signature, which is 55AA for any MBR block? And it rereads it to make sure that it was done correctly. So in theory, if I'd let that written uh, right to the drive, um, an F disk minus L will show that drive empty. Obviously, I did the N, which was like the dry run, so it hasn't actually done it, it's just done the output. But the output is what I would expect because it's a GPT disk label type. So, as you can see there, so that is correct, it's identified it correct, correctly. Um, so, what I'm going to do now, and warning if you do want to keep your windows, make sure you take a backup first of all. Um, this will just get rid of everything. 
I'm going to rerun this command now to wipe the disk completely. So again, the output is the same as you'd expect. It's gone through the same motions, but this time it's actually made the write to the disk. And you can see that this is now empty. It's still got this information about the GPT P PMBR mismatch. That's because it's only a raise of sig signatures, not the actual layout. But when we go into FDisk, we can rewrite a new GPT uh, structure and it should get rid of that. So let's now do FDisk with the device name. Paste that in. And it's created automatically a DOS disk label. Well, we don't want that. With the UFI, you need to create a, a GPT uh, partition type, GPT layout. So if we do M for menu, you'll see there's an option there to create a new empty GPT partition label. So let's do that straight away to change it from that DOS one. So you can see that it's created a new GPT disk label. So now if I do P to print it out, you can see now it says disk type GPT and it's got a new signature as well. In fact, if I write that, and now do F disk minus L. Okay, still can see this PMBR mismatch. So there's still something left on that disk. I won't worry about that too much. Um, if we'd erase this disk properly, I think it should go properly. Um, but otherwise it won't interfere with the Linux from scratch or anything that we're doing. So let's go back in here. We'll do P again just to check that it still retained everything as we'd expect it has. So let's now start creating some partitions. Um, first thing I'm going to do is to create a boot partition. It says highly recommended uses partition to store kernels and other booting information. So let's create that one and it recommends 200 megabytes. So let's do N for new partition number one. First, let's go accept the default and we want it to be 200 megabytes in size. We do a plus to indicate that we're telling F disk. We want to, we want it to calculate the sector to give us 200 megabyte partition rather than explicitly specify the sector number. It's warning us that it contains a VFAT signature, so that's what was there before. So we want to remove this signature. And that's been written, so now let's do a P. You can see we've now got partition one is a 200 megabyte Linux file system partition. There's not actually a file system on there, but it's been reserved to be used as a Linux file system, and it will be our boot partition. So to save me from scratching around, I'm going to keep a note of what I'm doing. Otherwise, I'll forget what partition's what. So I've got partition one will be my boot. Now, as you can see in the uh, information here, it says to create an EFI system partition, which will need to boot from UEFI or using UEFI. So I'm going to create a new partition. Partition two, first sector, and um, I'll make this maybe 200 megabytes as well. So the last sector will be plus 200 megabyte partition. And we need to change the partition type from Linux. It's got to be formatted as a FAT32 partition. So I'm going to do T here to change that partition type. So it's partition two. So set the default, do L for list, and we want uh, EFI system option one. So it's on the list here, so just press Q and put in a one, and you can see it's changed the Linux file system to EFI system. And we can print that up to confirm that. Um, we'll then need a swap partition. Now, to be quite honest, with modern computers these days, they've got huge amounts of memory. Um, building Linux from scratch system probably doesn't need more than 
well, it depends on how many cores you're using, to be quite honest. Um, probably no more than a gigabyte per core to build the system. Um, and that's just building Linux from scratch. If you do go on to build beyond Linux from scratch, some packages need um, about two gigabytes per core. So if you haven't got enough memory, you're going to either have to reduce the number of cores that you're compiling with or use a swap partition. And it's debatable as to which would be faster, using all cores with a swap file or using a reduced number of cores without a swap file. Um, I don't know which would be faster. It would depend on the speed of your swap drive, whether it's on um, magnetic media or whether it's on a SSD or an NVMe. Um, and then, of course, with those two technologies, you've got the worry maybe of uh, the swap wearing the uh, sectors out a little bit faster, possibly. Um, so it's all things to consider. Now, this machine's got 128 gigabytes. It's got quite a lot, but I'll still create a swap file. Um, maybe useful. So I'm just going to create a small two gigabyte swap file for the system to use. So I'll do new. Partition number three, first sector, just take the default, and I want a two gigabyte partition, so add plus two G. It's created that. It's defaulted again to Linux file system, as you can see there, so I need to change the type of that. So press T again, it's partition three. I'll do list, and I need to look for a Linux swap. There it is there, so I need to change it to type 19. So press Q type 19 and you can see it's changed to Linux swap press P and you can see that's now altered and finally I need to create a partition for the root file system you can build other partitions for different parts of the system um, for example they highly recommend a home partition um, maybe not for personal use so much um, you might want to share it across different builds. You could get into the problem there of if you're using different versions of Linux or Linux from scratch, uh, beyond Linux from scratch, um, that different versions of software write slightly different configuration files and that could cause a, a problem if you're going backwards and forwards between different versions. Um, in a work environment, it might be more useful in terms of making it easier to back up user data if you've got several users under that home directory um, for example if the home directory is on a server maybe um, so really it's more of an advanced thing to create these partitions on uh, separate devices or, or sorry these directories on separate partitions so I'd recommend just to build um, everything else apart from the uh, partitions we've built so far so we've got one separate for the boot and one for the EFI boot. Um, I would just create one partition for everything else. So let's do a new partition number four. Take the first sector and this time we'll just accept the default last sector. And you can see it's created a new partition four of the type Linux file system and it's used the remainder of the disk space which is about 475 gigabytes. Um, it's also warning us that file system RAID signature on partition 1 will be white. Well, that's that um, EXT warning it came up with. Uh, there, a, a VFAT signature. Sorry, not EXT. So it's just reminding us that that's going to be wiped. So what we need to do now is to do W to write that information to the disk. And that's done. So now if we do fdisk-l, we should see all that information. Um, it's actually changed or come up as the swap being Apple HFS, HFS Plus for some reason. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong partition. Uh, yes, it's come up Linux swap, 2 gigabytes. I was wondering why it was 3.5 gigabytes. Um, uh, like I say, I've, I've seen this before and I've never really looked into why it occurs. Uh, it does. It won't cause a problem. Um, I'm not sure if it's something to do with F disk or or what it is, but it's not not anything to worry about in particular. 
So now we need to moving on to creating the file system. So we've created the partitions, but there's no file system on those partitions. We need to create that file system so that we we can actually start writing files um, to them. And they've given us a clue here that we can use make fs to write to uh, an ext4 partition. Um, the only exception is the EFI, EFI system, which must be a VFAT type partition. So what I'll do is I'll create the file systems for the boot partition, first of all. And then I'll do the root partition. That's a point I didn't make a note of these to remind me. So that's the EFI. Partition 3 is the swap. And partition 4 will be the boot, uh, root So this will create an ext4 file system on the boot partition, partition one. So I'll press enter. It's done that. Now I'm going to do the same thing for partition four, which will be our root partition. So this obviously takes a little bit longer. It's discarding the block blocks that um, have been marked as available. And that's written that. So we've done the two uh keep looking at the wrong one. Two Linux file system partitions. We're now going to do the EFI system. I'm not sure if it's got the command here for formatting. No, it hasn't. The FAT32. What we need to do is to put in a type of file system as uh VFAT and put another option F32 to use 32 bit blocks. I believe that stands for. In fact, if we put in a help, we can read what the help says in KFS uh, dot VFAT, I think it is. Yep. Help. Um, so the type won't be here because we've specified VFAT, but it's the F. Yeah, the F size is the fat size, so it's 32. I believe it's 32 bit. So let's go back. So the type is VFAT because that's the type of file system we want, and we want 32 bit um, fat size. So, and this has got to be on partition 2, which is the EFI partition. Uh, Oh, has that got to be? Right, what have I done wrong there? Right, let's try using VFAT then. I've probably put the wrong um wrong type in there. Let's try was it VFAT? Yeah. Let's try it like that. Yeah, that's worked. Uh, I've I've obviously done something wrong with the uh the layout of this. I'm not sure if this is wrong or I've done this in the wrong place or whatever, but if you use the MKFS.vfat uh command it does the same thing as what I was doing, just in a different way with a few other options. So that has now formatted. Um, the last thing we need to do is to make the swap file or the swap partition rather. So we can use that with that command. We just need to put in partition three because that is our swap partition. And that's the swap partition done as well. So although we can't see it, we have actually uh, formatted each of those partitions with some sort of file system on uh, NVMe 1, that's the one. So we've formatted partition 1 and 4 within the ext4 parti uh, file system. We've formatted partition 2 with a VFAT 32-bit system and we've formatted the swap partition with a swap signature. 
So we can move on now. And what we do here is we set an LFS variable which points to a location where we're going to be mounting these partitions for the duration of the time we're building Linux from scratch. So it's important, this is really important actually, to make sure that this is set correctly at all times because, or at least all times outside the true environment, because if it's not set, A, you'll get problems, and B, you could actually overwrite the host system. And if you're using a host system that you've booted from, that you use for other things, as opposed to a live um, host system, such as what I've uh, used here, um, there is a point where you could run some commands and it'll it'll trash, it'll overwrite the host system and trash it and make it unusable. So it's extremely important. You'll see me checking every now and then to make sure that the LFS variable is actually set. Um, uh, you can set it to anything, but by default it uses MNT LFS, so we will we will be mounting these partitions at that location. Um, even though it doesn't exist at the moment, let's set it. So we can check that it's set at any time by running this command, echo $LFS, and you can see it's taken the value that's been specified after the equal sign. And it says one way to ensure that it's always available is to modify the bash profile of the user that you'll be running from. So that's the user, uh, the root user, and any other users that might be using it. As we've booted from a live CD, um, there's not much point in that um, because as soon as we boot, it's lost it anyway. So let's move on, mounting the new partition. So we, we've created this location, but it doesn't exist. So if we look at MNT, you can see there's no LFS mentioned there. So this next command will actually mount, uh, sorry, create the partition. And if we do a listing again, you can see it's now been created with today's date and time. The next command we've got is to actually mount our partition. So let's put that in and we need to replace this XXX with the actual partition number. So if you recall, the root partition is partition four. So that's the partition we need to put in here. And you can see it says it's been mounted. Um, if you're using multiple partitions, which we are because we're using boot and we're all also using EFI as well, which is mounted under boot. We need to mount those as well. So as it suggests here, we can do make the LFS with any supplementary partition. So we want to create a um, boot partition under the root. So this will create a partition called forward slash MNT, forward slash LFS, forward slash boot. As you can see, it's created it. And now we can mount our boot partition, which is partition one at LFS boot. Um, and again, it's saying it's assuming that we're not gonna restart the computer throughout the LFS process. And, and if you do, you need to remount um, these partitions and we also need to turn on the swap device so we use this swap on command and the swap device as you can see is device number three so as you can see it's found it and it's activated it as well I'm not going to mount the EFI system until we come to that part because as I remember it creates that bit for us or it gives us instructions on how to do that. So that's all the partitions we need for the moment.